Should I start, Silva? Okay. So uh, thank you for letting me uh, doing this speech today. Uh, so uh, my name is Benjamin Giraud. I'm coming from Bionic Robotics, which is a small company in Darmstadt. But I worked five years at the DFKI, so it's not really uh, there's a link somehow. And also, I'm doing this talk about the the robot, but I didn't do that much on the robot, so I'm presenting mostly the work of my colleagues, because I only arrived in the company a few months ago. Uh, so these, these are the name of the colleagues who really did the work, actually. So I'm just presenting what they did. So uh, it might be a bit odd to present things about uh, ROS also here. In fact, we use a combination of Orocos and ROS, so it doesn't really 100% fit in the topic, but I guess it's a good idea also to see what kind of tools I can reuse maybe from work and how we can build up something interesting without rechanging everything. So the motivation uh, about what I'm talking about is this uh, small robotic arm, which is called Biorob. And the main idea is to develop an elastic uh, sort of arm with elasticity in the joints to allow collaboration with the, with the human. With a, uh, so a robot that would be safe and uh, lightweight uh, to allow, for example, here on the left picture, you have a guy working together with a robot, so collaborative work. Or it could be also just used for normal pick and place applications uh, where you might want to modify the sequence quite often or adapt or displace the robot uh, in many, many situations without having to spend a lot of time in reprogramming the whole thing. Uh, just a small overview of the state of the art in this uh, topic of a safe uh, industry robot. Uh, in fact, you have different approaches to solve this problem. We have a specific one. But there are all other ideas uh, to make an industrial robot safe for the human. So one idea is just to make it somehow uh, like soft or put some uh, thing ar around it, like in the, uh, the green robot, it's a Fanuc robot, so you just put some sort of uh, structure to protect uh, the robot, not to make it too hard when it collides. You can add sensors that avoid collisions uh, when they come close to an object. Uh, and you also try to uh, make the arm lightweight, so the more lightweight we are, the less dangerous it would be. So that's an approach, for example, uh, that you have above. Then you can have also active compliance from the software uh, side. So uh, here in the middle, you have the KUKA LBR or the universal robot on the, on the right in the middle. So what they do is they measure the external forces. So the UR is uh, using the current, motor current directly and uh, guesses the, the external torques. And the KUKA is using sensors, force sensors in the, in the robot. But that's relying then on the control loop and on the software. And what we wanted to do with the Biorob is to have directly a mechanical uh, compliance system. But then you have uh, elastic, elasticity in the joints. And also uh, the fact we are using cables allowed you to have a really lightweight at the end effector. So all the weight is brought at the, at the bottom of the robot. So at the end you only have almost only the smaller structural part at the, at the front, and uh, that's allowing really safe uh, robots. We are not the only ones. We have also other examples of uh, robots using really uh, passive compliance. So here, a bit more details. It is an old version. So in the, uh, it was a prototype from the university. It was a concept from a professor in Kaiserslautern, or Saarbrücken, I don't remember. A long time ago, then uh, the TU Darmstadt, and then it made a, it came, became a company, a startup company. So at the beginning, you had uh, springs, you had cables and springs, and now you have the spring directly in the joints. So it's a bit different. And the idea is you have the motors at the uh, at the back and the weight at the at the front. Yeah. So the the problem uh, with this robot or the, the challenges to solve with the robot were the elasticity. You have to deal with uh, elastic. Uh, joints, of course, and also the fact you have uh, you transmit with cables, so you might have problems. You have also coupling between the joints, and also we have uh, issues with the 
tension in the, in the cables. So you have to make sure the uh, cables are at the proper tension all, uh, all the time. So here a bit uh, about the technical specification. So we can lift up to 500 gra grams with a gripper. So it's uh, not a lot for an industrial robot, but it's, we cannot be, uh, be bigger because then it wouldn't be safe anyway. So uh, it's about six kilo, including the PC, so uh, it's around five kilo, like, let's say. It's really lightweight. And we want to use uh, 12 uh, volt, so it's a uh, low voltage uh, equipment, so it's also convenient. Not dangerous. So a bit about the control aspects. Uh, so the, the main challenge was to um, modelize the, the elastic coupling in the joints. Uh, so in fact, the, 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 there's a sort of uh, coupling that comes from the difference between the rotation of the motor and the rotation of the joint. And uh, normally, if you have no external forces and no gravity, it will be, uh, when you turn the motor, it will directly turn the, the joint. But for some in reasons, uh, yeah, friction and etc., when you turn the motor, it wouldn't, we won't uh, directly turn the, the joint. So, so you have uh, this. Uh, you have to modelize and know this uh, sort of uh, elastic coupling between the, uh, the two, and that means you have then from the desired joint position, you want to uh, de derive the desired uh, motor position, taking uh, the gravity into account. Also, you have uh, couplings with the joints. So when you rotate uh, here, uh, so when you rotate this joint, okay, come here, you have a coupling. So this joint is uh, rotating automatically. So you have also to take these couplings into account. So it makes it, makes it a bit uh, more difficult. So the main idea was to uh, obtain these parameters, this uh, coupling between the, the different uh, motors and the joints. So you end up with a sort of non, uh, yeah, sort of a coupled uh, matrix. You see you have on, not only terms on the diagonal. So we made experiments to obtain these uh, values. Somehow they are accurate. They, are, they didn't allow us to uh, use the whole model. We only, at the end, we only modeled the, the impact of the gravitation, but that's enough for the control for now. So here you see the nice formulas at the, at the bottom, but in fact, in the control loop we use at the moment, we, we just limit it to the uh, gravitational part. So in fact, we have, we have a feedforward term that will predict the rotation, the, the rotation of the motor, and we, we also have uh, motor model that's also taking count the gravitation into account. So you have a fit forward term and then a normal classical uh, PD control loop. So that's for the control aspect and the safety aspect. Uh, so what we wanted to uh, to assess is that we are safe for the humans. So we we made some tests and also uh, wanted to make sure we are not too hard when you are colliding against something, but also when you are clumping against uh, something. So a, ma a big danger with the industrial robot, they will uh, come and maybe uh, get your hand and they will not move back. And that's, uh, that's really like the worst thing in fact. Because they, okay, they, they might hit you, it might be dangerous, but also they might just get you unstuck and you cannot move anymore. And uh, since we have elasticity in the, in the robot, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit safe. So you have uh, other robots that just, when they detect a collision, they just move back, like uh, per software. But here we have the opportunity to do it manually. Also another problem or another danger is when you collide, in our example too, uh, then you will load potential energy in the, in the springs. And when you release, uh, for some reason, maybe you are stuck and then you will release, for example, the movement and then you have like three times more energy than, than you had at the collision because you accumulated a lot of energy in the springs. So th this is also a danger that had to be, to be uh, checked for the test. So what we did is we went to the Berufsgenossenschaft, so the German uh, institution for safety at work, 
So they said, okay, you have to uh, hit this uh, sort of, I don't know how you call it, uh, the sort of force sensor with a uh, full speed, and uh, we'll check if it's uh, too much or not. And in our case, uh, they say, okay, it's below uh, the limit, so it's not going to hurt people, it's not going to be dangerous. But nevertheless, uh, you should not be able to hit the neck or the head directly. So they say, okay, it's not dangerous for the, uh, for the body, but you should not be able to have the robot hitting you in the eyes, for example. So that's uh, some limitation. But they have different, no, but they, they really have different uh, requirements for the kind of parts of the body, like for the feet, it's not that no, it's dangerous. Then, then humans will work mostly for the animals and only then for humans will get the eyes. Yeah, I know, but yeah. So you have to, maybe to have wear, uh, to wear glasses or have clothes or be careful. In fact, uh, the safety is not, we wanted to prove that the robot is as safe as we could, but then it really also depends on what you put at the end effector and where you put it. And if you lift heavy loads, it might be also dangerous just to drop it. So it's not, I mean, we cannot, the safety of the robot is, uh, itself is a very good point and a good start point to, uh, to make sure we are in a safe environment, but it's not enough, then it will be a, you have to see the whole, the whole thing. So that, that's for the safety. Now for the hardware and software, so uh, just to uh, explain a bit. In fact, we use Etacat. So you have an Etacat booth running in the robot. I don't know if people know Etacat. It's a sort of real-time internet protocol. And in fact, we have really no intelligence in the robot. So uh, we could expect we have like uh, eye electronics in the robot. In fact, we just have motor slave that just give uh, PWM signal to the motors and measure the sensor values. That's it. And the rest is running on the PC or on the laptop. And then you have the, like, the control PC, so normal Ubuntu. We use ROS, Oracles, and also a driver for Etacat. And we just need, uh, the good thing is, we just need an Ethernet port. That's it. We don't want to need all the fancy uh, IOs. And then also, it's, um, we want to sell the robot. It's not really uh, the same as doing research. So if we want to have a digital, well, all the IOs, we use uh, this kind of uh, like uh, couplers that you can uh, extend uh, as you want. Like if you want to have to have digital inputs or outputs or serial uh, in, uh, like adapters, you, you can just add it and use Etacad the same way as we use for the, robot, uh, for the motor slaves. So it's quite convenient for us, and it's also easy. So the, the, now the, the software looks like this. So you have two parts. On the, so you have the robot. On the left, you have the world in uh, real time, the RTT world. And for the user interface and the process control, which you are running with ROS. So somehow you have two parts of the software in two different frameworks, somehow. And we made it uh, work together by uh, somehow making a bridge. We made a sort of custom bridge between the topics and the uh, data exchange between the rock, well, Oracle's uh, task. So uh, the part using RTT, so that's the thing. We didn't use uh, tools from Rock or like Orogen or this kind of stuff. So maybe it would be interesting for us in the future to, to use more and more tools because, I mean, it's a lot easier to manage tasks when you have uh, tools just to create them, connect them, to uh, see their state. So for now, it's like uh, per hand, how, uh, as we did. So you have a big part, which is the big driver that manages the Etacad communication and uh, recognize what kind of devices are present on the bus. And then you have the core of the system, which is uh, computing the inv forward inverse kinematics, controlling the motion of the motors, and this kind of stuff, and the control loop. And then you have the ROS part. Actually, it's the Python version of ROS, so, so it's in Python, not in C++. And you have uh, the process controller that just loads a XML file that describes the whole process you want to do, like move to this point, uh, grasp something. So. It, for industry or application, you don't want that much dynamic 
uh, operations. Uh, you can really describe the whole process with an XML file, like a sequence. And also, so it just goes step, step by step, basically. And then the, the graphical interface is just an editor to edit your uh, process somehow and give you feedback about the state of the robot. Yeah, so it looks a bit like this. But I just want to be short, so I can just show it afterwards in, uh, in the demo. I think it's more interesting. So the kind of application we, we can have, uh, here is an example uh, on the bottom. It's a company in the Switzerland that is building these kind of washing machines, and they just want to uh, do some testing uh, after the, the production just to so they bring a sensor in front of the electronics, and then they can perform some uh, testing, and then uh, you go to the next washing machines. So the big advantage of the robot here, it was quite lightweight, and you could easily integrate it in the production line. So it's really like a, it's not even peak and place, it's just bringing the sensor in front of the object. Uh, those applications are more uh, peak and place application. So here you just want to move an object to another position, like from a tray to uh, another thing. Another thing is, uh, here the good thing, uh, you have a, a nice case for the robot, so it's quite easy to carry. So I could bring it uh, by train yesterday, despite the strike, so I made it somehow. So it's uh, also quite convenient. And also I guess for uh, integration on a mobile robot, it will be also quite easy, because it's quite, uh, quite small and lightweight. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, what we did with this robot, so now, uh, like the control part is somehow uh, finished in the first place, so we're quite happy. Now we could always improve, but we have a stable system that's safe, that's uh, easy to use, and that's uh, lightweight and also accurate at the, at the same time. Now we have uh, improvement to do on the graphical interface and also a lot in doing with uh, ap applications for the client. So a very really specific uh, thing, working on the, being like uh, able to work in clean rooms, electrostatic uh, issues, for example, not to the damage the object that we grasp. So it's more going in direction of making a robot, which was a research prototype, uh, being able to be used in industry environment. So that's it for, uh, for the presentation. And I hope I have a bit of time, yeah. five minutes, just to switch it on and just uh, show how it works, if you're OK with it. I just have to switch it on. Ah, it's already on. OK, cool. So in fact, you just have to connect it. It will initialize, come to the first position. And I just want to show you how we did the uh, programming. I should have bought Mars, but I forgot. I was wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, also the, the main advantage of the robot, since so, I just removed it. Uh, I actually could do it. So the main thing that you want to do is to have something really easy to program. So do you, you don't have to uh, do complex stuff. Just use the mouse, and that's it. So here you can add elem uh, process elements. So here it's not, the motors are not on. So you can just grasp the robot and bring it to the position that you want. So let's say you want to come here. And then you can say, okay, that's my first position. And then I should have bought a mouse. Actually, I have a mouse, but I forgot to take it. Then that's your first point. And then here an example, you want to do a 1D interpolation. So I will make it like this. And then you go to interpolation. Okay, so you go to the first part. You come from here, maybe you come above your first bounty. Let's say here. I don't see anything. Okay. 
Uh, maybe, maybe you can click. Okay, just let's say you come here. Uh, on plus. No, yeah, plus. Yeah, yeah this one. Yeah, no, the plus. The green plus. Okay. That's the first point, and then the second point here. Yeah. And then just uh, then you say, okay, you want to at this position, you want to close the gripper, and then you want to come here. So maybe add a plus. Okay. And then uh, you want to do. You don't want to define the position of all the objects you want to grasp, so you just go to the last step, do the same, come here, uh, so you can click on plus, then here, let's say, and uh, where was it? Like here, I don't remember. Okay, that's it for the interpolation. We have four objects, just say you have four objects, and that's it. And maybe you just want to give it to somebody at the end. So just come here and oops, bring it like this and open the gripper. So you just click on plus. And on the right on gripper action, you can just say open. Yeah. Use gripper action. Open. OK, that's it. And finish. Okay, so that's the way you can. It's very simple. The way you can reprogram the robot. And then you can you can just try. So then you you switch on the motors, and then you can just click on play, and hopefully it will work. And you have to loop. Hopefully it will work. Comes here. Cross the bunty. Goes further. So you, we, what we are missing is a feedback about the state in the trajectory. But that's the idea how you could easily program the robot without having a lot of. So he just interpolates the position. And yeah, so you can do it in 1D, 2D, 3D. Oops, sorry. And yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry. I think we have time for some questions. So if you have any questions. And one good thing, okay, ah, you can block the robot, it will detect a collision, and then you, it will go further. So in fact, it will detect a uh, discrepancy between the motor position and the joint position, and then it means there's a torque applied to the joint, and then will stop the movement. So you just stop it, and it goes further, and that's it. I'm ready. <laughs> so, do you have any question? The way we did it, or nobody? You don't use KDL, no? For the kinematic, you implement your own. So, we have a geometrical solution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I guess uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I was not there, so. Mm -hmm. I, don't. I mean, in that case, it was made. Uh, for the, this robot specifically. The other question? No? Okay, then. I think. Assuming you have springs, how much energy can you store? I don't really know. Uh, can you throw the bounty? Can we? Can you throw the bounty? Like with the energy? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't try. I didn't try. <laughs> but you just want one, right? Like yeah. One. <laughs> yeah, give me one. Uh, no, I don't really know, but. You, you shouldn't be able to uh, store too much energy because then uh, it, it could be the, really be dangerous. So we have to find a sort of uh, good solution between uh, storing a lot of energy and if you are storing too many, too less energy, then you, you will uh, really fast uh, reach the the limit of the compression of the joint, the spring. So you have to find a solution. You could do it, but having the motors at the bottom, then you save a lot of weight at the end effector. So uh, like the mass uh, repartition yeah, here in that case is uh, really good. So then you don't move that much mass, so you can be fast and not being dangerous. Uh, here the wear factor would be much higher, your cable. Like the, uh, how the 
familiar and how they practice in terms of domestic and yeah. family living. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Now we have the coffee break, and after we have Siski, which is a system management tool of the uh, So you can upload your mind for the good and for the bad, so I, I will invite you to come here after the coffee break, half an hour.